Talk about burning the dish, baby. <laughs> Lucas and I promised in episode one that we would keep it real with you guys. We would take you guys along the journey of success and to success, whether that's our success or the people who we interview's success, right? And success would really not be what it is without failure, without losses, without making mistakes. And boy, did I make a really big mistake in this episode. (laughs) Here's what happened. We recorded our with our lovely guest, which you're going to listen to in a minute. And uh, when we sat down to start the interview, my mics stopped recording audio five minutes in. So we got five minutes worth of audio recorded on our lovely, beautiful mics that give us beautiful sound quality, which you're hearing right now. But the rest of the interview was not caught on these mics. (laughs) And now this was my mistake because what I should have done when I noticed that they stopped recording was just stop the interview and say, oh my gosh, these are not recording. We need to figure it out. I didn't want to look unprofessional. I didn't want to look like I didn't know what I was doing. And so I just let it go because I knew that we had the video audio from the camera. Okay. And that's what you're going to hear. I paid somebody, an audio mixer, master, literal magician, God sent person to work with this audio and make it sound as best as they could. So I'm coming here to tell you before we dive into the episode that the audio in this episode is not the usual audio you guys are used to. And I apologize from that. I burned the dish big time. So the audio in this episode is not going to be amazing, but I just wanted to keep it real with you guys and tell you that this is a part of podcasting and building and following your dreams and starting a business is you make mistakes and I wanted to just be honest about it because I think it's relatable and it's kind of funny, but I also wanted to let you guys know that there are so many nuggets of wisdom in this episode. I mean, every single time I was listening to our guests speak, I was like, that's a real, that's a great little clip that we can clip and put on social media. That's an amazing tip. Like people are going to eat this up. And so I'm just letting you know that the audio is not going to sound great, but please bear with it because you are going to get so much out of this episode. So much wisdom for anyone who is looking to pursue their passions and succeed in their career and really do something that they love and make it work. So with that said, the audio in this episode is not going to be great, but the wisdom, the content, the things that were said and shared and advice given is better than great. So keep on listening. And I thank you for bearing with this audio and audio will return to normal next week's episode. Love you guys. Thanks. So Rick George has been the athletic director at the University of Colorado Boulder since 2013, but he's had a long history in sports leadership. Before Colorado, he was the chief operating officer of the Texas Rangers baseball club. And before the Texas Rangers, he was the vice president and chief of operations for the PGA tour and president, president of champions tour. That's correct. Cool. He's held many important roles in many important organizations, and I'm sure we've been missing a few, but today we are here to understand what is the recipe to having a successful career in the business of sports. So, Rick, welcome to What's the Recipe? Great to be here. Looking forward (laughs) to our conversation. Me too. So, obviously, you're the athletic director of CU now, but can you walk us through how you got here? Like, where did your love of sports specifically start? It started from playing sports. Um, You know, I've I've done that all my life, played football at the University of Illinois, got a great opportunity to be the recruiting coordinator there. Then I transitioned to Colorado at a time where I had my first child. um, And my wife said, you need to stop traveling so much. And uh, Coach McCartney had a position here at Colorado in 1987. Uh, We moved here. I was off the road, so I got to spend more time at home. We had our second child uh, in Boulder, uh, made a decision to leave to go to Vanderbilt to be closer to family, worked in the administration there. I had an opportunity to run the Four Kids Foundation, which hosted the uh, New Orleans PGA Tour event. And Commissioner Fincham called and said, hey, I've got a gig for you and became the president of the Champions Tour and then the PGA Tour and 
I got an opportunity to go to the Texas Rangers and then uh, my calling, which is being an AD. I got that in 2013 from the chancellor. So I've been blessed. I've, I've had uh, a lot of people, a lot of advocates that have really helped me along the way. And I never lost a job I should have gotten, and I never got a job that uh, I didn't have help with. You mentioned uh, Texas Rangers, now World Series winners. That's really exciting. Do you know anyone that's still in the organization? Oh, yeah. Like Colin, so congratulations. No, no, I did. I, I, I would text the owners uh, every day during the playoffs and uh, – and then obviously during the World Series and um, Ray Davis and Neil Liebman are two of the owners that were there that hired me uh, back in 2010. That's and special. So to be able to watch and see what they have done and the last time they went to the World Series was my first two years there in 2010 and 11. And in 10, uh, we got beat by the Giants in game five. Bruce Bochy was the coach at the time, now the coach of the Rangers or the skipper. And then, um, and then the following year we lost in game seven uh, in the World Series at St. Louis, so uh, kind of a full circle. Yeah, I noticed the the World uh, the uh, World Series champions uh, hat on your desk. So you finally got the hat. Yeah, yeah I finally got the hat. I'm finally sure, made it. I'm there. sure they're not going to give me a ring, but I'll, <laughs> yeah, that, I'll, I'll take it if they do. Right, and I want to quickly go back to to your days playing football. Um, obviously, you played for Illinois, correct? Mm -hmm. um, played a lot of games. Um, what was your forty time? Do you know? My forty time was around the four six. Four six forty as a corner. What's uh, good? I don't know. What's that's really you good? Be, you want to be, you know, four three, four four, maybe okay. four five. Four is a little slow. Four is though. elite. Four six is fast. What was yours? Uh, four nine. Okay. Four nine. So he was a lot faster than me. That's Can you still get him. No, because I pulled a hammy at about to the first ten yards. So no, I can not I want to go back a second though because I think that's something that's really hard for people who are. In their 20s, especially post-grad, when you say, you know, you got this opportunity from this person or this thing or that thing, people are so, you know, they don't know which direction to take and they don't know what opportunity to take. So for you, even I want to ask that question, like, were there opportunities that you didn't say yes to that you wish you did? No, there weren't really any that um, uh, I wished I would have um, said yes to. I mean, I... Uh, this path has been an incredible path for me, and, uh, and like I said, I've been blessed in, in being in these roles, and, um, you know, I've always had somebody to help me in those decision-making. Certainly, my wife has been my partner, Nancy, in this whole thing, uh, and then, you know, there's just people that I've met along my journey that have really helped me and advocated for me in certain roles, and um, I can't remember the last time I put a resume out there, but... Um, it's really connecting with people you know. It's treating people the right way. Um, you know, I don't think I ever left a job on bad terms. Uh, and I think every place that I've been has gotten better from the time I got there until the time I left. And, um, you know, and I think that's voted well for me in my career. And the other thing that I would tell to young people is diversify your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Don't be isolated just in one track where you can only do one thing. You know, try to explore other opportunities that are around you. Uh, that are going to give you a broader portfolio when you look for uh, opportunities in the future. And I and I love that. I know when you were sort of explaining your story and all the different, it's almost like you're jumping from lily pad to lily pad, just climbing up that ladder of life. And every opportunity you said, I got a call from so-and-so. Mm -hmm. I got another call from him. Let me know that I had this opportunity open. And that's from creating relationships. Yeah, right? look, th this business is all about relationship, particularly in sports, but I, I think in life. Um, you know, if you treat people well um, and, and you just treat them the way you want to be treated, you're going to go a long way because people won't forget that. And, um, and it's important um, that um, as you go along, the relationships that you have, keep them, bring them with you. I mean, I had my uh, assistant that worked for me at Vanderbilt in 1991 that just came to a game uh, this fall. I haven't seen her in 20 years, but, you know, you uh, I don't think there's anybody that I missed in my career that, um, you know, that I, I don't keep connected with in some way. I think that's really, sorry, Adam, just on this okay. one point I love because I feel like in our generation, it's really hard or people don't find value in that, in creating those sort of uh, healthy relationships, especially in the workplace. It's sort of like I'm doing my thing. I don't have time to make friends. Well, here's the other thing that goes into that is so many people are working from home now. So people aren't really necessarily in those positions to meet people like they used to, I feel like. Yeah, and, and that's hard because if you want to build a culture, and I've been, you know, I come from a family of eight children, and 
family. Whoa, with family. eight children? Yes. Yes, I was the middle one. That's why I'm so shy. So I'm <laughs> middle child, child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Child, yeah. Child, yeah. Child, yeah. Child, yeah. yeah. But there, there were eight of us, and so I try to structure, you know, the culture and, and the place that I'm at that's relatable to family. Our staff knows that if you've got something going on with your family, go watch your son or daughter play. Mm. Um, we expect that in 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 college athletics and, and in sport in general, you have to be present. You have to be in the office because we have 380 student athletes that come through here every day. We gotta make sure that if they're here, we're here uh, to support the, you know, them along the way. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's really important to me. I really wanna just talk about one more time with the opportunities thing. I think people don't really know how to say yes to opportunities or when to say no. For you, how did you know when to say yes to an opportunity? You know, really, it's by doing research um, mm -hmm. and, and by looking in and, and then also looking at, uh, and I always ask people, what do you want to do 10 years down the road? Mm -hmm. Now, there's not 10 years down the road for me because I'm, I'm not going to do this that long. But for people that are, you know, and I ask people all the time when I'm sitting here and they want advice and, they're, and I say, what do you want to be in 10, 15, 20 years? And does this opportunity that you're contemplating does that put you in a position to be in that role that you want in 10 or 20 years? And if you think along those lines, I think your path gets a little easier. Uh, but also, um, I rarely look at resumes. Mm. When I sit down um, with a candidate for any role, it's about the person. And it's about the connection and, you know, how, because, you know, uh, athletics, it's, it's not carrying, you know, some horrible disease. It's about supporting young men and women. Um, and It's about the energy. It's the about energy the energy. energy. Exactly. And so, you know, I want people that are personable, that can engage and interact. And, um, you know, when I sit down with somebody, I want to know about them and about who they are, because that's more important to what's on your resume and what experiences you do have. Because you wouldn't be sitting in front of me if you didn't have the experience. Absolutely. And it's, it's important for, you know, a staff to be likable as well. When you have recruits coming through the building, you know, are they going to speak to someone who they're immediately going to say, I like that person a lot, right. you know, that they, they, they held an impact on me. Yep. Um, so I love that you doing your research right in the flesh, you know, you don't want to see any sort of uh, resume it doesn't, doesn't mean anything to you. No, it doesn't. I, I don't look at the resume uh, other than to see where they had been in case I know somebody there. Um, but I want them to tell me who they are, what's important to them personally, what they like to do when they're not here. Uh, just things like that that I think are important, uh, you know, because you're going to work alongside them and maybe 11 o'clock at night, like we've done at three football games already this mm -hmm. year. Uh, we get home at one or two in the morning and it's not an easy, uh, athletics isn't easy, but you know, to be able to watch young men and women compete at a high level and see the satisfaction on their, self, their face when they win, it's all worth it. It's special. Yeah. You mentioned your wife briefly, and I would love to talk about how you balanced, like you were saying, kind of jumping from lily pad to lily pad, lily pad, really focusing on your career, which is a very demanding one. How did you balance also having a beautiful family life? Yeah, look, I don't, I think sometimes when you're young, you don't understand the importance of that. Maybe mm -hmm. probably didn't do a great job of that. That's why I'm really good with my grandkids mm -hmm. because I know what I missed with my, my children. Um, and I wish that was more present um, when I was younger. And I think that's something that I would tell everybody, family is always important. They're the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And when you're young and you're trying to climb the ladder to get to where you're going, sometimes you, you get blinders on to that. Uh, but that's one thing I wish I would, uh, uh, you know, I wish I would have done in my younger days when I was a young father is be more present. Um, but I'm really present in their lives and have been for the last 20 years. How long have you been married? Uh, 40 years. That's a long time. Whoa! Congratulations. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, we, can, just, we just celebrated 40. That's can you tell us stuff. the story of how you and your wife met and, and came to be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we, met, we met each other our freshman year. At Illinois? At Illinois. She was a cheerleader. I was a football player. Love it. We didn't date until um, we had both were in our last semester there. We Really? Of, did you at least like always oh, no. see oh, yeah. each other? Yeah, know? and I knew a lot of her sorority sisters and right. cheerleaders and 
maybe dated one or two of them. For sure. <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, yeah, we, we came together in April, got engaged in August, and wow. Wow. got married the next June. So, um, you know, I, I knew what I wanted. She knew what she wanted. And, um, you know, we we're, like I said, we we're blessed with two great uh, daughters, uh, Christine and Jenny, and my two granddaughters, Maddie and Harper. Girls. Girls, I'm surrounded by them, and I love Can't it. Get away from them. No, I love it. Look, yeah. I I love working alongside women too, and yeah. um, and um, I've always uh, had women in my executive teams, and um, I've always had a diverse group to that, and um, you know, having two daughters, two granddaughters, a wife, and two female dogs and a male dog is a long dog. Right, you've got your you've got your uh, you've got your dogs. How would you say your wife has complimented your success over the years? Well, look, she takes care of everything. Right. Um, she takes care of me, she takes care of the house, the kids, the grandkids and everything that we do, we do together. We go to every game together. Um, you know, we travel together when we watch our teams on the road and um, you know, we we try to find time with just her and I, but um, she's as big a part of the success that we've had over the last 30 some years, I guess now, or closer to 40, <laughs> uh, 40 years that, you know, she's a big part of it because whenever we make a decision on a move that we're going to make or somebody calling, you know, asking if I'm interested in an opportunity, it's always a discussion that she and I have together. And if she Love says that. no, she's the one who got me to Colorado. Um, and she wanted to come, and I had a great role at the Rangers, and you know I was pretty comfortable there. And she says, "Okay, oh, we need to go back to Colorado. You know, we love that place." And finally, I said, "Okay." She won. That is very interesting. Yeah, she she uh, she was the one who first wanted to be back in Colorado. Why is that? Is it was it the weather? Is it the well, lifestyle? Look, we, I, I think it's all of the above. Um, right. The weather here is phenomenal. The lifestyle is great. Um, but the fact that one of our uh, children grew up here, um, Jenny, the oldest, and then we had Christy here uh, the year before we left uh, at Boulder, we just had some natural connections here. And we still, and again, it goes back to the reason I got this job is the chancellor and I worked together when he was a dean of education, mm. when I was a recruiting coordinator, and we worked together and he reached out and called me. So there's a, a, a great example of you know, having a good relationship right? and him calling me and saying, you know, are you interested in this job? And again, Nancy told him yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know a happy wife is a happy life. There so you go. Nancy said, hey, Texas is too damn hot, Rick. It's time for us to get out of here. Well, look, and, and, and I would say this to all the, the, the young guys out there is um, your spouse is really important and you got to make sure that when you're making a decision, don't do it in a vacuum. Make sure that mm. she has a seat or he has a seat at the table uh, when you're making uh, those decisions because it's important because it impacts not only your life and your career, but also uh, your spouse's career. That's really valuable. But I'm sure she also wants to see you be your most successful, happy self, right? And I'm sure she probably saw how happy, like, she was, and you guys were in Colorado, so maybe she was also like, I want to be back there because of that as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think that had a lot to do with it. And again, she has say in everything. And right. a lot of times she makes the decisions, <laughs> um, which is, is fine with me. I make enough of them there. Yeah. And, and I've seen previous interviews with you where you mentioned a few times where an athletic director position was something that you aspired to be back in the day, didn't get the opportunity. Um, but you getting an opportunity to be an athletic director here, I mean, the stars really aligned there for you. Yeah, it did. I mean, look, I, I got impatient. I thought I was better than I was, and I should have gotten a role as an athletic director when I was younger, which I shouldn't have looking back, but I thought I did, and that's why I pivoted and went to the not-for-profit route with the Four Kids Foundation running the PGA Tour event in New Orleans, and everybody thought I was crazy to get out of college athletic, but it's probably the best move I ever made in my mm -hmm. life because it gave me a different perspective and it gave me um, different um, opportunities and it broadened. I mean, every job I took, I learned something different. So at the Four Kids Foundation, you know, to run that and not for profit. So every dollar you spend, you're taking away from giving to children's charity. Right. It had to create an event that was really good. So because we had an event that was not doing well when I took it over. And now it's thriving in New Orleans and it's the Zerg Classic and they've got this team concept that's going really well. I just saw today they gave two point eight million back to children's charity. So I learned a lot about fundraising. That that works your fundraising. Yes, yeah, it, sure. it does. And, and then, you know, I had the ninety percent of my staff was female. 
So being able to work with females early in my career, leading them, uh, I think has is, is boded well for me. And then when I took over the Champions Tour, my right-hand person was Donna Fedorowicz, um, who was our Tournament Business Affairs Director, Vice President. And she and I had a great relationship. We still do. Um, and so that was another experience for me to learn how to deal with 100 or 200 and some independent contractors, the players, to deal with the rules officials where they have, a, you know, a little bit of a union and, you know, to deal with CEOs and to meet different people. I mean, there were just learning experiences, everyone that kind of helped shape me. And the reason I went, left the PGA Tour to go to the uh, Texas Rangers, one, it was a great opportunity. But two, I felt like in my resume, I needed more of a, a business um, lesson uh, on on running a big operation yeah. like the Texas Rangers, because you got owners that don't want capital calls. So you have to generate more revenue than you're paying in expenses. And sometimes those contracts for uh, professional athletes can be very challenging to meet. So, right. you know, I learned a lot about that and then getting the opportunity to come back and to help shape you know, young people for the next four years of your life. I felt like that was kind of my calling. Did you ever deal with um, imposter syndrome? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I love the answer. I think, I think so many people nowadays who are young might get these like big roles or feel like they can't apply for a job title because they don't feel like they're qualified enough or they don't have experience enough or they don't feel like they can add as much value to that because for literally no reason all other than they don't have the experience and they don't feel confident enough in themselves. Do you think you ever struggled with that even in the early days? I think I, uh, in the early days, um, it was just because of lack of experience. So mm -hmm. I did interviews early in my career that I'm, I'm like, now I'm looking back and I'm like, boy, you blew that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you had no idea what you were talking about. But I think the experience of interviewing is really important. Yeah. I tell some of our staff here that interview because it'll help you down the road on, and, and, and an interview is all about your experiences, how your experiences apply to the role that you're working on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, I, I, I learned a lot in, in those interviews and I didn't do well in a lot of interviews early in my tenure, early in my career, because I didn't have the experience, mm -hmm. but the experience of being in those interviews have really helped me in my career. Yeah. And I think even with the concept that we're doing, it's like you have to get in the kitchen to really learn how to create and, and perfect that meal at the end of the day. And uh, I think so many people our age feel afraid to even just like go take the interview because what if I do flop or what if I do mess up? But I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that that's actually so important to your growth. Yeah, it, it is. I think you learn more from failure than you do from success. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at failure, you're saying, okay, why did that happen? What do I do differently in the future that doesn't allow that to happen again? And for me, you know, in that first interview, I think I was interviewing for, a, um, um, oh gosh, the St. Louis U job when I was in my 20s, the AD job. I had no business being in that room. But it was about, I didn't have experiences. I didn't have the knowledge of how a, a program was run. But it was great for me to go into that because I started to learn how to interview and how to prepare and, and how to go in there and, and do the things that I do. And it, it all comes down to your experiences and what did you learn from those experiences that are gonna allow you to succeed at that opportunity that's in front of you. Right, I love that because I think in our generation, you know, especially through social media, we see a lot of success. That's a lot of, you know, the only things we see is everyone being so successful, everyone achieving their goals. So people like us sometimes won't even try to to get there won't, won't even try to, to make the meal because we just think we're gonna burn the dish regardless. You, you can't make the shot unless you take it. Right. Exactly. And so for you know people out there, you know, the young people, take the shot because you never know. And and if you have the knowledge and you have the confidence in who you are, um, just share who you are and, and, and your experience that make you the best candidate for that job. Were you always a very confident person? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Not overconfident. Yeah. But but yeah, I was a confident person. I think yeah. you have to be. Right? Yeah. You know? Especially being an ex college football player, you know, you played in a lot of games. You got to know that you can kind of fold someone in half if you needed to, right? Well, look, I mean, I was a, a, a cornerback and probably a slow cornerback, and I had to be out in the open garden, guys out there. You know, when you're playing man to man and got beat enough times, and you got to have confidence to get back to the line the next play. And, 
you know, make something, make a different thing happen uh, that's in your favor, not against you. How did you know football was your sport? You know, as a kid, did this start from, you know, playing, you know, backyard bull crap with the friends and be like, oh, I kind of like doing this. You know, I, I, you know, in the, in, you know, when I was young, um, we played all sports. Right. I was probably better than in baseball than I was in football. But I had an opportunity to go to college where I had a full scholarship, um, you know, um, that I was fortunate enough to get uh, when I was in Illinois. Um, and it's kind of propelled my career because it gave me the opportunity to get an education, to learn. Um, and, you know, I'm fortunate to be in the position I'm in. I'm curious if you have any advice or like maybe your secret sauce of how you like deal with maybe burnout or stress. Like how do you keep, you know, this confidence in, you know, being able to execute on your day to day job? How do you navigate like stress and really help yourself there? Well, look, the, the, I mean, uh, any good leader, you, you've got to be kind of low. Uh -huh. You can't get too high. You can't get too low because in, in athletics, there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows. You win, you're excited your way up there and then you lose your way down here. Then you got to kind of maintain that. But for me, it's, you know, you got to take time. Um, you know, I, my faith is important to me. So um, I spend time reading and, you know, reflecting and, and things like that that I think are really helpful for me because it is a, a stressful job. But you got to get away from the job, too. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand that, OK, at some point, clock out, right. go home, spend time with your family, be present with them. And like, I don't keep my phones next to me. I put them up in my room when I get home because I want to focus on my family and being present. Um, when I'm with them, and uh, I think that's really important. Um, and you got to find outlets. You know, I work out in the middle of the day. Usually mm, from eleven thirty to one, I work out. I can reset. I can think about what I did in the morning, what's coming ahead, uh, and I can kind of get some of that stress out by working out uh, and and thinking about that. So you just got to have your own way. Um, but you know, because there's a lot of stress in life in general. Uh, not just in, in your work environment, there's stress at home, there's stress, you know, in your community, I mean, in this world, I mean, and you got to find a way that, that's good for you to balance it all. Uh, because if you let uh, something that's negative get too big in your life, um, that's going to tear down some of the rest of the things that you do. I'm curious when you're working out, going to the gym. That was my question. Do you have any of like the uh, strength, and, strength and conditioning coaches like putting you together a little workout? Do you have like your go-to sort of this is what I do? Yeah, uh, yeah, this is what I do. Okay. <laughs> so I try to work out every day. It's on my schedule every day. Um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm on the elliptical and I'm doing my thing. Uh, I've got my own workout I, I do on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Saturday and Sunday, Nancy's usually got me in the yard working, and so I've got a seven-day regimen, but Tuesdays and Wednesdays are really just for uh, weights and uh, setups and, you know, all those kind of things. And I know you mentioned, sorry, but I know you mentioned that, you know, when you're interviewing someone, a big question for you is, what do you do outside of work, you know? What do you do outside of your, you know, daily responsibilities at work? Uh, when you go home, spend time with my granddaughters. Um, they're the love of my life. Not that my kids are my life, but uh, they're one. And Sorry, two. Chris, Yeah, they're, they're one and two now, man. Yeah. Hyper, but um, you know, just spending time with them and, and spending time at home. I try to, you know, fortunately, my family loves sports, so we watch sports together at night, and um, you know, just kind of have some downtime with them, and you just got to make sure you do that because you know, a week ago I was going seven straight days just working and doing things, but. Uh, when you're home, you got to be present. How regimented, because you mentioned your schedule, and I'm like a freak about my Google Calendar. Like, I have a Google Calendar, I have a to-do list, I have probably three other Multiple winners. avenues. Yeah. For you, do you have to be super, like, structured with your schedule? No. The only thing I like this structure is that noontime. Yeah. Um, and then I'll do whatever meetings that I have to do or whatever calls I have to do through the course of the day. But I do like time alone. When I come in the office in the morning, that's my time for reflection. So mm. uh, I spend the first half hour by myself um, and then uh, go tackle the day. Mm. When you say reflection, what does that look like? Like, do you put pen to paper or is it kind of just sitting alone? No, it's sitting alone. It's, you know, I read the Bible. I have some, um, um, some guides that I look at and some daily uh, devotionals that I look at. And um, that's how I start my day. I love it. What time are you here at the office? 
It, it depends. Yeah. You know, um, I used to be this big stickler that I had to be there at a certain time. And, you know, I mean, 10 years later, I'm sure that, you know. Well, but, you know, with college athletics, I mean, look, um, you know, Saturday I got here at two in the afternoon and I went home at one o'clock in the morning. And yeah. Our hours are different. So I tell our staff all the time when we built this building and everybody was going to be and everybody was concerned that. It was going to be eight o'clock. You had to be there. Or Rick was going to be watching over you, but not in this business, um, right? You know, because there's so many different hours that you put in, um, and so I get in around eight, um, you know, somewhere between eight and eight thirty, and stay as long as the work needs to be done. Like tonight, we got a women's basketball game, and we'll go watch them and get their second win. Huge win over the LSU Tigers. But I don't know. Really exciting stuff. It was really exciting stuff, and um, just to see them. Um, I was actually watched the first half at the men's basketball game, and I watched the second half in my car driving to Colorado Springs for a region meeting. That's really exciting. So it was fun. Before we move into some other things, the last thing I just want to ask from you is, you know, again, there are a lot of, I think, student athletes specifically who come out of college and maybe don't go on to play professionally, but feel like lost because their whole world was sports. What do you have any advice for people who are in that category? No, look, I mean, you it, the, the reality is 97% of the student athletes don't go pro, you go pro in me something, and myself included. Yeah, me too. You go pro in something other than sport, and so that's a challenge that's tough on some people. And you got to make sure that you're looking after them and you got to prepare them for that next stage. Mm-hmm. But also, those that do go to the NFL or the NBA. Their careers aren't long. Mm. Um, you know, I think the average is three to five years. So what are you going to do in your mid-20s, your early 30s? So the education is still the most important part to make sure that they have a meaningful degree that they can get opportunities whenever that ball or, or the puck or whatever stops bouncing. Mm. And, you know, we, we have sort of this subtopic that we like to speak about within our podcast called burning the dish, right? We think it's really important, like you said, um, all of your lessons come from a small loss, per se. Would you say there was a pivotal part in your professional career that was you almost burning the dish, but coming out of it with an incredibly valuable lesson that you apply to your daily um, daily work? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, again, for me, I, I, I think, um, you know, somebody always asked me what my weakness is, and I said it's in my, my impatience. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, and when I left to go, you know, I questioned myself once I left to go get out of college athletics and go into the Four Kids Foundation role. Uh, my wife was like, what are we doing? Um, and, Interesting. And, um, but for me, it was I needed to change um, and because it wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. And that could have been good or bad. And fortunately, you know, I've said this a couple of times, I've been blessed and uh, it was the right move for me. It allowed me to go to the Champions Tour. And then, I mean, I've had some incredible jobs in my career. Um, because of that move. Because of that move. And because and, of what and your I gut yeah, was saying, I need to get out of here. Yeah, and it was my gut, but it, you know, it also was something I prayed about and thought about. And, um, and again, it, it ended up being the best decision I ever made in my career. Love that. Thanks for that answer. I appreciate it. Yep. And then one thing I also wanted to touch on, I know we've um, had a chance to speak about a lot today, but just being an athletic director in general, right? You know, I, I was an athlete my whole life. I've met high school athletic directors, college athletic directors. Can you give us a sort of a high level overview of what an athletic director does for an organization? Everything. Everything right? <laughs> There's really no uh, typical day. Um, you know, you're fundraising, you're dealing with problems, you're going to games, you're meeting with donors. Um, there's just a variety of different things that you do on a daily basis, and no day's the same. And I think that's what keeps it from getting stale, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because you get so many different things, and I, I like to solve problems. I like to have solutions to, to things that are out there that we need to address. So it kind of gives you energy, and it, it kind of keeps your, your, your mind going and thinking about how do I solve this, and, and, and what's our answer to this? Um, and just, you know, it's different every day. And I think that's what I love about it. Right. And also thinking of ways to enhance, right? Yeah. I literally just saw on Instagram today, ESPN posted about a new Jumbotron or a new screen going up in mm-hmm. at Folsom Field. Is that a project that you as the athletic director brings to the table? 
it's either myself or one of our team. Uh, you know, I've got a great executive team, and uh, you know, good leaders always have great people around them, and that cover the flank where the leak. And I just got great people, and you know, this is an an area that we had to make a change on our scoreboard because it was getting old and it wasn't effective. And you can see how small it is, and it's going to be mm -hmm. five times that size wow. next year, and it's going to enhance the experience. And and look at, at Colorado where I sit today, um, we we're putting it all in the center because uh, it's time for us to really elevate our department in all areas football through you know whatever sport we saw what women's basketball did men's basketball is going to be great soccer just got a bid to the ncaa that's the kind of success that we need to have it's very exciting. but it takes resources to do that um and that's a start and there's other things to come right and i'm sure you know the past 10 years you've been here now with coach prime in the mix I mean, all eyes are on CU. All eyes are on the bus. Have you experienced anything like this? No, I mean, it's it's a, a lot um, because it is a lot of exposure. I mean, we're leading the country in viewership. We're right. Still, and I mean, the social media hype is just yep. wild. It is. It's crazy. Somebody's like, well, did you see that on social media? No, I don't have <laughs> time to do that. Um, and, and I don't get on social media as much. I, I usually get on social media when I'm working out at lunch. Yeah. And I just repost things that our student athletes are doing or our successes of our team. And today was signing day for a lot of our sports, men's, wow. women's basketball, cool. soccer, um, and, you know, track and field and others. And uh, just seeing those come through and it's kind of fun. Speaking of Coach Prime, I feel like we, I mean, we're at Folsom Field, we're talking about, but we need to like talk about Coach Prime. Can you maybe walk us through like the story of like how that came to be? Because you were the one who made the call. Yep. Can you, can you talk to us about how that came to be? Look, it's it's not a, a great story. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we have some mutual friends uh, that brought us together. Um, you know, we had a conversation to start the process and you know, I told him the good, bad, and the indifferent. I think it's important for people to know what the blemishes are and, um, you know, where your issues are, as well as, you know, the, the things that we haven't uh, captured and done well. And we had a long conversation. We didn't talk a lot. Uh, I'd send him texts of our stadium and the backdrop and games when we were 0-7, and um, we had 44,000 people here about the support we had. Um, and then, you know, he and I met, and uh, once we met, um, we both trusted each other. Um, I told him, here's here's what we've got. He told me, here's what I'm going to do. And he's done everything he said he was going to do. And this year is just the tip of the iceberg, but it's brought a lot of exposure uh, on our department, our program, our university, and our community. And I think it's great for everybody. I saw in a previous interview, the first time you ever met in person was at his house, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. What was that like? Did you guys share a meal together? We was did. It what would you eat? I have done barbecue. Barbecue Love. food. Southern barbecue. Did he cook it? Did he have a chef? No, no, no. Yeah. He had somebody that brought it in. Okay. That's great. Yeah. There it is. Barbecue. It's a good choice. Yeah, it was great. And, uh, you know, we got a great visit and um, he's our coach. That's really exciting stuff. And I also, you know, that huge, uh, you know, his first um, speech to the team, the I'm coming, mm -hmm. those two words, really impactful. I saw that when he called you to tell you that, you know, he was coming, like you were the first, per you were the first individual ever to get the I'm coming. Well, it was I coming and we coming. Um, so uh, I was actually on my way back and I was at an airport and um, Constance, who's uh, his business partner, uh, called and said, coach wants to do a three-way call. And so he gets on the phone and um, he said, hey, my man, how you doing? I said, I'm doing great and get ready to jump on a plane. He said, well, I'm coming. And I said, what? He said, we're coming. And I'm like, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. And he says, I'm coming. The Lord spoke to me and uh, I'm coming to Colorado. And here we are. So in that moment, when you hang up the phone, like you're the only person that really knows what just happened in that conversation that you're around. Are you doing a little happy dance? Are you doing a little looking up at God? No, say, I, I had like, to. Get, what was that moment? For I you? had to get on the plane. Yeah, and that's when I kind of processed it all, um, and because we still had to keep it quiet for a couple of weeks, uh, because he had a season to finish, and right. um, and you know I wanted to be respectful of that, um, and so I was pretty excited on that plane right home. Did you expect it to have this much impact? Not this much, no. Um, the impact's been um, significant. Mm. It's been good. Yeah. No, it's been insane. I mean, we were just here too at the 
um, CU game on Saturday. And I mean, I went to CU. I had never seen a football game that packed here in my life. In my all four years, I was like, this is so crazy. (laughs) And it's something that, you know, I mean, what a legendary move just to add to your legacy here. I mean, that's that's incredible. So maybe it um, it was, uh, you know, coach always says, you know, I want to go where I'm needed. Mm -hmm. Right. And he was needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he's doing a great job in uh, support him and what he's doing and he's the CEO of that football team and um, I'm letting him do what he feels is right because um, he's done it before and he's been successful with everything he's done. I love it. Well, any final words of encouragement for maybe just people, again, post-grad in their 20s who are feeling a little lost and trying to find their own recipe to success? Anything that you would say? Um, No, I would just, you know, look at what, what are you passionate about? You know, I've left jobs because I, I lost my passion. Um, and, um, you know, if you're passionate about something, that's what you should do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm passionate about serving our student athletes. I love coming to work every day to see them. I just had a student athlete that designed some shoes for me cool. uh, today to wear the game Saturday. And just having those interactions with young people, uh, I'm passionate about young people. And, um, you know, if you lose your passion, you're lost. Right. Do what you're passionate about and do it well. And uh, and then, you know, hopefully it propels your career to where you want to go. I love it. Well, Rick, we can't thank you enough for uh, letting, you know, us young people have an opportunity to, to interview you today and um, over this beautiful view of the field. Um, the way we conclude all of our interviews. So there's a term in the restaurant industry when you run out of something or when something's done or closed out. It's 86. Yes, it is. Do you mind looking at the camera and saying that this episode is officially 86? This episode is officially 86. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Don't, 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 don't.